Rob Picconi, Chairman, Co-Founder and CEO at Energy Vault, who joins us from uh, Los Angeles, California. Rob, thank you so much for your time. So, uh, forgive me if I'm oversimplifying how this works. You use uh, surplus electricity to raise these 35-tonne bricks. When power demand rises, those bricks are then lowered, releasing kinetic energy back to the grid. So on average, how much can it store and how does it fit into the decarbonization narrative? Well, we can store uh, up to hundreds of megawatts of power, uh, even multi gigawatts of power. So it's really ultimately scalable, it just depends on what the customer needs. Uh, and in terms of what we're delivering and how it works, we take uh, excess wind and solar, as you said, we can take any power source actually to charge that system. And then those blocks are lowered and orchestrated all by an AI and computerized vision control energy management software platform. Uh, and that orchestrates the whole solution so it's fully automated. When power is needed from the grid, we lower those blocks and it discharges that electricity to the grid. So this is a solution that uh, complements uh, lithium ion batteries, which are great for uh, short term use, but not for more uh, durable storage solutions, Rob. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We're uh, doing the higher end of that shorter duration. Uh, we also don't degrade over time like lithium ion does. So we have those economic benefits on a levelized cost basis over time. We don't have to uh, replace uh, depleted cells like you do, for example, from your electric car or your cell phone or laptop. So that's an important benefit. And the other one is the sustainability. So this was a focus for us, Sri, that we didn't want to solve one problem in renewable energy and create an environmental liability. So we're safe, we're local. Uh, most of the money that's spent with us is done back into the local economy with the construction. Uh, and, uh, and sustainability is very important to us. So we can use uh, very low cost materials, even the soil to make those composite bricks. We do not use concrete. Uh, but we can also use things like coal ash, uh, tailings from the mining process, so other waste materials that otherwise would be destined for landfills. Interesting. And just uh, bring us up to speed with uh, the China project. And if, if we look at some of the visuals of uh, the early uh, prototypes, some of the feedback from uh, clients was that they were a bit too tall, might not comply with uh, international uh, building codes. You've changed that, yes? Yeah, we have. So two pieces of feedback from our customers and we listen always to our customers. And in less than four years, we actually iterated the product based on that feedback. One of them was about the form factor. So they said, hey, could you build something a little shorter in height that you could permit really anywhere, anywhere you can permit a 20 story building? So we shrank and lowered that height um, by about 40%. The other feedback they gave us is our first product was focused only on long duration, really eight hours and longer. Uh, now we have a product that you can build out in a modular way so that you can um, essentially do that higher end of shorter duration, two to four hours. And because it doesn't degrade, unlike like lithium ion, for example, uh, we can seamlessly do the longer duration up to eight, 12 hours, which gives other economic and flexibility benefits for the customer. And SoftBank made a $110 million investment in en Energy Watt Vault about uh, two years ago, right? 2019, I stand corrected. Is there more capital coming from uh, SoftBank? And uh, what does SoftBank bring to the table? Well, SoftBank was an important... Sure. Uh, uh, SoftBank was an important partner earlier on. That was our Series B, and that was a very large one. It was one of the largest Series B investments in energy storage. But beyond capital, SoftBank brought a global network uh, given it invests all over the world. So that was very important in our earlier stages. Now we've evolved on where we have investors that are coincident with customers that are some of the largest companies in the world. So for example, Saudi Aramco, the largest energy company in the world, BHP, the largest mining company uh, in the world, Korea Zinc and their portfolio of partners down in Australia, Sun Metals, Arc Energy. It's the largest producer of non-ferrous metals in the world. So we have now a coincidence of these investors that are customers that are supporting us on global deployments. Rob, and you're also uh, quite active in uh, India as well, uh, and you have uh, local partnerships uh, there. Is this a development, or is this a, a, a model for renewable energy that can, that can work in, in, in a de developing market context? In yeah, terms it's, of the it's, 
Yeah, sure. It's so important. So the economics is one of the things we focus on to solve because a lot, a lot of people wouldn't know this, but uh, to create electrons now, you can do it very cheaply with wind and solar, one to two cents a kilowatt hour. To store electrons, fundamentally, uh, it's extremely difficult, both technically and sustainably. So it's a factor typically of almost 10 to 15 to actually store those same electrons. So to your question, the economics was very important for us uh, and which is why we chose gravity and existing technology, some innovative software, some very focused and advanced material science so we could avoid the use of both expensive and non-sustainable materials. But also emerging markets are the countries that create most of the greenhouse gases. So if you look at China, why is that so important? Um, China produces GHGs in the amount greater than the next four largest countries combined. Um, India is one of those countries. So uh, India is important, China is important. We're deploying in the United States uh, as well this year. So it's really fundamental uh, for us to have that focus on emerging markets because that's where a lot of the GHGs are emitted in very large quantities. A couple of questions, uh, Rob. Uh, are there risks associated with uh, the business model? And is this a model that can be scaled even further? Yeah, so the risks really are just related to the first deployments of our technology. The good news is it's proven. Gravity's been around forever. It's really not an idea, it's the law. Uh, and the large pumped hydroelectric dams use gravity and they're the basis of 90% of all energy storage today are these large pumped hydroelectric dams. So we're taking that same technology and just applying some 21st century software, uh, some sophisticated engineering. So from our perspective, this is all about execution and deployment. So I, I would say there's really no risk from that perspective in terms of execution. Uh, and then to the second part of your question, I think what the way we think about um, those deployments and the business model itself with customers, most of our customers want to own this infrastructure. So what we're seeing is customers want to buy it, pay for it along the way, and take it over and own it and use it as their asset over a long period of time. And that's a great benefit of our technology, we're infrastructure. So our technical life is at 30 years plus. I mean, it's essentially just a building. Um, so it could theoretically last um, much longer than that as well. Rob, we'll leave it there, sir. Thank you very much indeed for uh, those insights. Robert, thank there you for having from, me. Uh, Energy Vault, we appreciate it, sir. Thank you.